I've got to keep the calm before the storm. I don't want less, I don't want more. Must bar the windows and the door to keep me safe, to keep me warm. Yeah, my life is what I'm fighting for. Keep my head up, water, don't let me drown. It gets harder on me to you there at the altar as I fall down to my knees. Don't let me drown, drown, drown. Don't let me, don't let me, don't let me drown. So pull me up from down below. Some Good morning and welcome to Urban Grace on Palm Sunday. We are so glad to have you worshiping with us today. Urban Grace is an ecumenical church, which means that we are a church that isn't organized or defined by our adherence to a single Christian tradition because we want to celebrate and incorporate all the great diversity of different perspectives that are different Christian backgrounds bring. We are also a church that uh, finds our unity and our identity in our service of and to our local community, particularly through social engagement and social justice programs and partnerships. We're a church that believes that God is revealed through creativity and thought and art. So we uh, partner with and work to support the local arts community in Tacoma. And lastly, we are a church that welcomes people exactly as they are. So no matter your church background, your race, your ethnicity, your gender identity, your sexual orientation, your abilities or disabilities, no matter exactly what you believe, you're welcome to participate in the full life of the church today and every day. And today is Palm Sunday, which is the final Sunday in the season of Lent. And in Lent, we prepare for Easter through repentance and reorienting ourselves to God. Lent is a, a little bit more somber in its tone, and we 
add prayers of confession and absolution. But Palm Sunday has a mix of joy and sadness, which will be reflected in our service today. So look out for a little bit of extra joy from our kids who helped us with our Palm Sunday processional. So we are so glad to worship with you today. And now Abigail will lead our call to worship. The Poet Thinks About the Donkey by Mary Oliver. On the outskirts of Jerusalem, the donkey waited, not especially brave or filled with understanding, he stood and waited. How horses turned out into the meadow, leap with delight. How doves released from their cages, clatter away, splashed with sunlight. But the donkey, tied to a tree as usual, waited. Then he let himself be led away then he let the stranger mount. Never had he seen such crowds. And I wonder if he at all imagined what was to happen. Still, he was what he had always been. Small, dark, obedient. I hope finally he felt brave. I hope finally. He loved the man who rode so lightly upon him. As he lifted one dusty hoof and stepped as he had to forward. Be thou my morning, Urban Grace family and friends. Um, I'm here to talk to you all about our last symbol for the Lenten season. And that symbol is, you guessed it, palms. Um, so for Palm Sunday today. Hope you're having a wonderful Palm Sunday. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about the significance of palms. Now, when I think about palms, uh, my, my mind automatically goes to like sunny California. And that's 
where it went for a really long time until um, it was explained to me as a kid uh, the significance of palms um, in church and so in the Lenten season. Um, so it was explained to me. I'm going to try my best to explain it to you um, so that you kind of have a similar understanding to what I have. Um, and so the significance of palms um, in church and um, the Lenten season in general is that um, long ago in Jesus' time, um, palms were used as a way for the Jewish people to celebrate military victories. And so when a battle was won, when a war was won, um, the Jewish folks would wave palms um, to celebrate those victories. Uh, it would be very similar. You see my friends here. Um, we're big Star Wars fans. Um, very similar to when the rebel forces defeated the First Order and um, the Death Star and um, Darth Vader and those folks. So when Luke and R2 and Obi-Wan and the rebels, um, you know, they, they defeated the, the, the first order and, and, um, um, those forces, then, then we would celebrate them by waving palms and saying, Oh, you, that was a military victory there. Now, the significance with, um, Jesus and palms is that, um, rather than having, you know, tie fighters and, and, um, finding a big death star and all those things, um, Jesus didn't have a big battle, didn't have a big war, um, um, didn't fight. Uh, Jesus came in riding on a donkey and, uh, and just had his friends walking with him. And the Jewish people declared that in and of itself a victory. Um, their king had come. Um, and and it's, it's so different from anything that they'd have ever, ever experienced before because Jesus came in um, riding on a don donkey, um, humble as ever, and um, they declared him um, the son of God and, and, and their king. Um, and they waved branches to celebrate um, this victory, this victory that Jesus had come and, and, um, and was their king. And so it was such a beautiful thing for me to hear because it was like he didn't need all these like great big battles and wars and all those things. Um, he just rode in on a donkey and was celebrated um, coming to to be with his people and uh, to be um, the savior of the world. Um, hope you all have a wonderful Sunday. Hope, hope that that uh, explanation of palms and the significance of it was helpful for you. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next week um, at our Easter celebration. Come ready to run and grab some Easter eggs. All right. Have a great Sunday. Uh, we love you, Urban Grace family. It's that time again. Time for announcements. So, Amanda, what do we have today? Details about Good Friday and Easter. On Good Friday, we will be collaborating with eight other local congregations for an online Good Friday service. This will be a service of scripture, prayer, music, and art that seeks to make space to mourn the brokenness that led to the death of Jesus and the pain and brokenness in our own lives. It will be live streaming at 7 p.m. on the YouTube channel for the Center of Urban Peacemaking, and you can find that link in the description of this video. So Amanda, what's the plan for Easter? We're meeting at the Fort Nisqually Outdoor Picnic Shelter in Point Defiance. And how do we get there? And where do we park when we get there? Park in the parking lot right next to the shelter. Well, what else do we need to know? Wear lots of layers because it's going to be cold as... Maybe I should jump in here and remind you to make sure to bring an umbrella in case it rains and bring a chair so you have a place to sit. There will also be bathrooms available. And after a brief worship service, we'll have an Easter egg hunt and a scavenger hunt for the older kids. So remember to come here to the Fort Nisqually Outdoor Picnic Shelter at Point Defiance on Easter next Sunday at 10.30 a.m.
unless you're feeling sick. And then we ask that you stay home to make sure everyone's safe. And of course, we will be asking that everybody wear a mask and social distance throughout the time that we spend together on Easter morning. And if you don't feel comfortable, we will also have an online service at the same time on Facebook and YouTube. Now, shall we pass the peace? May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's share Christ's peace with one another. Will you please pray with me? Loving and gracious God, we give thanks for your Holy Spirit that fills our world, that fills our souls and our bodies and our lives. And we pray that through that spirit, we may hear your word for us today. Amen. Mark 11, 1 through 11. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, Its master needs it, and he will send it back right away. They went and found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them just what Jesus said, and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. Many people spread out their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord! kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. After he looked around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. 
well, that was a lot of fun. But puppets and donkeys and unicorns aside, what exactly is happening on Palm Sunday? Why is everyone so excited about Jesus riding into town on donkey back? Well, probably because their lives are about to change. For hundreds of years, Jerusalem had been ruled by foreign armies like the Canaanites, the Persians, and the Greeks. The Romans have now moved in and rule the land with cruelty and violence. But this man on a donkey is a sign that liberation has finally arrived. Because, well, for one, it's Passover when as many as a million Jewish pilgrims flock to Jerusalem. This is the one time of the year when the crowds are, are big enough to revolt and overthrow the Romans. And the crowds know this. And the Romans know it, which is why their leader, Pontius Pilate, feels the need to intimidate the crowd by mounting his war horse and parading with his cavalry through the main gate of the city. And Pirate Pilate would pull this stunt every year during Passover. But this year would be different because finally the prophecies were being fulfilled. The Holy Scriptures promised that one day the Messiah would arrive to, to save the Israelites from their oppressors. The Prophet Isaiah told that the Messiah would come from the house of David. The prophet Ezekiel told that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem through the eastern gate. And the prophet Zechariah told them that this Messiah would be a king, coming triumphant and victorious, wait for it, humble and riding on a donkey. And that this king on a donkey would defeat the chariots and the war horse and rule from sea to sea. And now, this man Jesus, who is a descendant of David, is arriving through the eastern gate of Jerusalem riding a donkey. The, the tales of his power are great, so surely he will be the long-awaited Messiah who defeats the Romans. I mean, so like, that's probably what the crowd was thinking. Because Jesus was using religious symbols from his faith to announce himself as the Messiah and directly challenge the Roman government. And, and now, after that, the stage is set for a showdown. The crowd is ready to go. They have their leader. So what does Jesus do? He rides through the gates of the city, he looks around, and he leaves. Jesus heads back to his friend's house in Bethany, which had to be pretty disappointing for the crowd, or at least confusing as to like what in the world Jesus was doing. But Jesus would be back the next morning to challenge the temple by flipping over tables, kicking out the merchants, and once again riling up the crowd so that he could bail and go hang out with his friends in Bethany. Jesus led the people to believe that their lives were finally going to change. He gave them hope only to disappoint them. So it's, it's no wonder that the crowd turns on him. Jesus publicly humiliates the temple, so it's no wonder that the religious leaders plot to kill him. Jesus publicly challenges a military dictator, so it's no wonder that the Romans arrest him. Honestly, none of the things that happen uh, through Holy Week, after Palm Sunday, none of it's a huge surprise. It's 
as if Jesus is trying to turn everyone against him. I mean, Jesus had to know that this plan would end in his death. So, why did he do it? The, the answer I learned growing up was that, that Jesus needed to die to satisfy God's divine wrath. It went like this. God made a deal with humanity to, to be our God. But we broke our end of the bargain by sinning. And the consequence of breaking the deal was that blood needed to be shed. That's why the animals were sacrificed in the temple. But the blood of animals wasn't enough. We were so bad that the sacrifice needed to be a perfect person. So. God sent Jesus as the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God. That's sort of uh, what I heard at various points in my life in different churches or through professors or whomever. And that answer does a good job of, it, of explaining why Jesus would set up his own death. It, it seems to fit okay with the scriptures in the New Testament that talk about the saving blood of Jesus. And it, it actually fits with our experience. When something goes wrong, it's got to be someone's fault. Someone has to pay. We do this in, in all different areas of our lives, from the criminal justice system to politics to business to our relationship. When the chaos of the world around us and, and the chaos of the world inside us is too much to handle, we look for a person or a group to blame so that, that we can feel okay, so that the world makes sense again and justice has been done. And if we do this, then it makes sense that God would do it too. But, but here's the thing. If Jesus died because God demanded blood, where does that leave us? With a God who makes peace, peace through violence? Because that's actually the opposite of what Jesus did. Rather than succumbing to the crowd's desire to, to overwhelm Rome's violence with their own violent revolt, Jesus chooses a way of nonviolence. Jesus does the opposite. Jesus provokes the crowd, the temple, and the Romans to turn on him, to make him the scapegoat who they will kill in an attempt to relieve their own fears and disappointments. Jesus shows where our addiction to violence will lead, to, to Humanity killing God. But then Jesus is resurrected to tell us that he still loves us, that the way to peace and, and salvation and liberation is not through violence or dominance or transferring our pain onto some vulnerable other. Jesus provides a path to new life where, where our pain, our, our fear, and our disappointment can be transformed through a, through a loving spiritual community that supports us as we, as we face the wounds that lie behind our anger. Jesus offers salvation through love in the midst of our brokenness, our pain, and our hurt. And, and I didn't actually really plan to preach this particular sermon on Palm Sunday about like divine wrath and divine violence and scapegoating, but, but then the last couple of weeks happened. 
Like after a mass shooting in Colorado, we heard cries to preserve gun rights because only our guns and our violence can protect us from other people's guns and other people's violence. And after a mass shooting in Atlanta that targeted people of Asian descent, we learned that the shooter was so horrified by his own sexual obsession or compulsion that that he killed those who who weren't like him. He took it out on a group he could dehumanize and blame for the searing pain inside himself. And this was a man who was active in his church and probably heard the messages many of us heard growing up. Mary Christians telling us that sex is the most amazing thing that we can imagine, but that we're the worst kind of depraved sinners if we even think about it. And that somehow women are particularly to blame for men's sexual desire. And I'm, I'm not actually about to blame the church or make a scapegoat out of conservative Christianity, because that is not the path either. So let's, let's not do that. Let's, let's talk about us and how we can accept the invitation that Jesus offers on Palm Sunday. The invitation to reject the cultural and religious metaphors that lead us to believe that violence can bring about peace. The, the invitation to reject the, the cultural and the religious messages that, that cause the kind of shame and self-hatred that are so overwhelming that we externalize our contempt on others. This is an invitation to be a community where it's safe to be honest about who we are, what we feel, and what we fear. The invitation is to be honest with ourselves and what lies deep in our soul, all the while trusting and believing that God's word is true. That no matter what we've done, where we are at, or what struggles we may have, that we are loved and accepted by our Creator. Amen. Church, I'm Teresa Robinson Duane, and I'm here for our prayer today. So, we need to take time first off to confess our sins. But before we confess, we will hear the assurance of forgiveness. Because, well, we do this because we need the reminder that God's forgiveness is not like human forgiveness, it's not a transaction. Even before we confess our sins, we, they have been forgiven. And that means we repent not to avoid punishment, nor to get something in return. Rather, we confess so that we can bring our whole self 
to the one who loves every part of us. We are reminded of God's forgiveness so that we have the courage to search deep within ourselves to those areas where we may feel shame. We carry the promise that even the things about ourselves that disgust us the most are loved and forgiven by God. So hear now, friends, our God who is faithful and just has mercy on us. Our sins have been forgiven through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are called beloved by the Lord Most High. Thanks be to God. Amen. We confess that we are caught in cycles of sin, and you are our only hope. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Holy Spirit, you speak to our deep needs to be forgiven, to be known and still loved to be freed to begin again, to live content in joy and hope. In you is life, for you are faithful and just. You hold the words of life and promise that our sins have been forgiven through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are called beloved by the Lord Most High. Thanks be to God. Hi, Urban Grace. Just me and the mint plant today. And we're going to talk about offering. One thing that I'm glad that God offers us is smell. Mmm, that's good. When we think about offering, we might be like, during COVID, what can I offer? Well, we know there's a lot of need. And one way we can work through our church and the staff who are trying to provide for our community is a monetary gift. In this case, it would be our offering, which you can uh, give through this Facebook page or at urbangrace.org. Every donation helps to secure the future of the church and helps us support our neighborhood and our neighbors. Please pray with me for the offering. Lord, we're grateful that you have given us smell and hearts to serve others. Lord, we pray that we would be good stewards of the gifts that you have given us. Come and bless us in this time that we would be blessings to others. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Christ, all people here below. Praise Holy Spirit evermore. Praise Triune God whom we adore. Amen. Friends, Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Maybe I should jump in here. Make sure to also, I'm not wearing a mask.